would a mother go to keep her children safe? These are the questions we will be contemplating in today's case. But this time, the answer has a dark and disturbing twist you definitely won't see coming. What is up, Iwu crew? Today we are talking about the first known Italian female serial killer, a haunting curse, and a story about making soap that just might turn your stomach. Now, let's get into it. Leonardo Cinciulli was born on April 18, 1894, in Montella Avellino, in what was then known as the Kingdom of Italy. Leonardo had a tumultuous upbringing and a tragic conception. Reportedly, her mother, Amelia Dinolfi, had been assaulted, and afterward, she discovered that she was pregnant with Leonardo. In order to avoid ruin, Amelia was forced to marry her attacker. Due to the dreadful circumstances of her conception, Amelia resented her daughter and treated her terribly because of it, which led to the mother and daughter having a turbulent relationship. Due to her poor treatment by her own mother, young Leonardo allegedly attempted to take her own life on two separate occasions. The family lived in poverty, even when Amelia eventually remarried. Seeking to fix their financial issues, Amelia planned for Leonardo to marry a wealthy man, who then would help to take care of her family as a whole. But Leonardo disobeyed her mother's wishes, and instead married an older man named Raffaele Pensardi, who worked as a registry office clerk. Her mother was furious with Leonardo and allegedly cursed her for her betrayal and disobedience. Believing strongly in the power of curses, Leonardo would feel the consequences of her mother's curse for the rest of her life. Leonardo had reportedly visited a fortune teller at some point early in her life, who gave her a grim and heart-shattering reading. She was told that she would marry and have children, but every single one of them would die young. Perhaps seeking reassurance against this miserable fate, Leonardo later also visited a Romani who predicted her future by reading the lines on her palm. Leonardo was once again given a bleak prediction when the Romani told her, In your right hand I see prison, in your left a criminal asylum. Leonardo likely felt that the predictions of her dark future were the result of her mother's curse. Four years after marrying in 1921, Raffaele and Leonardo moved away from Leonardo's hometown and to the small town of Loria, where her husband Raffaele had grown up. For a while, the couple did well for themselves, as they both found work, but in 1927, Leonardo was arrested and imprisoned for committing fraud though it isn't clear exactly what her crime entailed. As soon as she was released, they moved to Lacedonia, where they were once again besieged by trouble. In 1930, the Irpinia earthquake destroyed the couple's home, though they both survived. At last, the couple moved to the town of Correggio, and their luck appeared to finally be turning around. Leonardo flourished, as she opened a small shop where she sold a variety of goods, such as soap and tea. There, Leonardo began telling her customers that she had special powers that could help their dreams to come true. Soon, she was telling fortunes and became incredibly popular in her neighborhood, as well as highly respected. People from across Correggio, women in particular, would come seeking her aid to help them manifest their deepest desires. Leonardo's life was still not without difficulty, though, and she struggled through the loss of many children. Though pregnant a total of 17 times, she lost three children to miscarriages, and 10 more died while they were still very young, mostly from a variety of illnesses. Was this her mother's curse? 
or the fortune teller's prediction coming true. Perhaps it was both. Only four of Leonardo's many children managed to survive past adolescence, which resulted in her becoming extremely protective of them. Any mother who had endured the heartbreaking losses of so many children would go to great lengths to protect the ones she still had. But Leonardo took her mother's love and determination much farther than many others would dare ever go, and it soon ventured to a place that was wicked and dark. Though Leonardo fiercely loved each of her four surviving children, she couldn't seem to help the fact that she had a particularly soft spot in her heart for one of her sons, Giuseppe. He had become her favorite, and so, in 1939, when he told her that he was going to go join the Italian army, which was preparing for the beginning of World War II, she was devastated at the thought that he might never come home from the war. There was nothing Leonardo wouldn't do to try to keep Giuseppe from harm, and luckily for her, she knew exactly what would ensure that he was kept safe. When the lonely Faustina Setti, a 73-year-old lifelong spinster, sought Leonardo's aid to help her finally find a husband, Leonardo saw an opportunity to break her mother's curse and guarantee that Giuseppe would survive the ensuing war. Leonardo told Faustina that she had found her a suitable husband who lived in Pola, which is now modern-day Croatia. For her services helping Faustina, Leonardo was reportedly paid 30,000 lira, which was all of Faustina's life savings. Excited to have finally found someone suitable to marry, Faustina soon began writing letters to the man who would become her husband and even received some back. But instead of celebrating the news, Leonardo convinced her to keep it a secret and not tell anyone. Little did Faustina know, it was Leonardo who was writing the letters back to her, posing as her would-be husband. Soon, Leonardo convinced Faustina to write letters to her family members in order to tell them that she had gone to Pola and convince them that everything was fine. When Faustina was packed to leave, with her gray hair dyed dark and her heart alight with excitement, she met Leonardo at her shop where the two women celebrated her new life with a drink. Faustina was never heard from again, but her concerned family members' minds were put at ease once they received letters written in her hand, explaining that she had left to finally get married. But still, none could understand why she hadn't told them herself or even bothered to say goodbye. Leonardo's shop was frequented by other women who, like Faustina, were seeking ways to make their dreams come true and change their lives. Francesca Sawavi, like Faustina, went to Leonardo for help to find another job, as the 55-year-old schoolteacher was feeling lonely in the small town. In exchange for 3,000 lira, Leonardo found her a wonderful job at a school for girls in Piacenza in northern Italy, she, too, was encouraged to write postcards to her friends and family, which were sent just before she left, but not to tell anyone of the job until after she arrived. On September 5, 1940, Francesca was due to set off and begin her new job, but before she left, she went to visit Leonardo one last time. An awful smell emanating from Leonardo's respected little store was occasionally reported by those living in the area. No one thought much of it at the time, as Leonardo was so well-liked. No one could even come close to imagining the depths of horror that had occurred in her kitchen. Undeterred by the occasional terrible smell known to seep up from the floorboards of Leonardo's shop, Virginia Cachopo went to visit in the hopes of also finding a new job, just as Francesca had. Virginia was a former soprano singer and had even sung at the famed opera house La Scala. But since then, she had fallen into a state of near poverty 
and was desperately seeking anything that would improve her situation in life. Leonarda appeared to work her magic, though not for a small sum. In fact, Leonarda demanded 50,000 lira, which was all the money Virginia had remaining, and even took some of her jewels. But Leonarda had promised her a position as a secretary for an impresario, an owner of an opera theater in Florence, and Virginia would have paid anything for the opportunity. Just like with Faustina and Francesca, Virginia was sworn into secrecy. But unlike the other women, she couldn't help but mention to a few people that she may have found a wonderful new job with the help of Leonardo. On September 30th, 1940, Virginia visited Leonardo one last time to say thank you and goodbye. By this time, People had started to notice that some of the women in the town, particularly the older and unattached women, were disappearing after visiting Leonardo's shop. Though family members of the women had received letters from them after they first left, none could get in contact with them again, which many found concerning and suspicious. Virginia's sister was especially skeptical of her incredible new job and as she had last seen Virginia entering Leonardo Cianciulli's house, she went to the superintendent of police to share her fears for the worst and to report Virginia missing. The superintendent of police began investigating and soon found Leonardo's ability to procure miraculous jobs and husbands very suspicious. The superintendent soon found evidence that appeared to indicate the three missing women were murdered, such as Leonardo selling off all three women's clothing and shoes. Because of this, Leonardo was arrested, but the superintendent wasn't convinced that Leonardo, an older woman herself, could have committed murder alone. He suspected that her favorite son Giuseppe must have also been involved. As soon as Leonardo realized that her son could go to jail, she admitted everything. She had killed Faustina, Francesca, and Virginia in the most horrible way. And to save her son from any blame, she gave a detailed account of the crimes. Evidently, when Leonardo had realized that Giuseppe could die in the upcoming war, she believed that it was once again the curse coming to claim the lives of all of her children. In order to protect her much-loved son and counteract the curse, Leonardo believed there was only one thing she could do. Human sacrifice. She knew that asking higher powers to preserve and protect her son would require a great sacrifice in exchange, which is why Leonardo sacrificed all three women in the hopes that it would ensure her son's survival. When her first victim, Faustina, had come to visit Leonardo one last time, Leonardo gave her a drugged glass of wine. As she fell unconscious, Leonardo struck her with an axe, killing her before dragging her body into a closet. Leonardo collected Faustina's blood in a basin and began cutting up her body into nine pieces. At her trial, Leonardo was said to grip the witness stand rail with oddly delicate hands and calmly set the prosecutor right on certain details. Her deep-set dark eyes gleamed with a wild inner pride as she made an official statement and described Faustina's gruesome fate in detail. She said, I threw the pieces into a pot, added seven kilos of caustic soda, which I had bought to make soap, and stirred the mixture until the pieces dissolved in a thick, dark mush that I poured into several buckets and emptied in a nearby septic tank. As for the blood in the basin, I waited until it had coagulated, dried it in the oven, ground it, and mixed it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs, as well as a bit of margarine, kneading all the ingredients together. I made lots of crunchy tea cakes and served them to the ladies who came to visit though Giuseppe and I also ate them. Francesca Soavi, the schoolteacher, was given the same horrible treatment 
on the night that she went to see Leonarda, where she was killed and dismembered with an axe. Her body was also made into cakes that were sold in Leonarda's shop. Virginia, too, came to the same dark and stomach-turning fate when she dared to visit Leonarda on the night before she was meant to leave. She was also drugged with wine and killed with an axe, and parts of Virginia's body were melted down in order to create soap. Leonarda gave a sickening statement about Virginia's death, saying, She ended up in the pot like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white. When it had melted, I added a bottle of cologne, and after a long time on the boil, I was able to make some most acceptable creamy soap. I gave bars to neighbors and acquaintances. The cakes, too, were better. That woman was really sweet. While in prison, Leonarda decided to write her memoirs, where she included advice on how to turn parts of the human body into soap. It was titled, An Embittered Soul's Confessions. Her trial was attended in droves, with people waiting for hours outside the courtroom just for the chance of getting a seat within. Allegedly, there was still skepticism surrounding Leonardo's ability to kill all three women, despite her gruesome details of the crimes. In order to prove that she had committed the murders alone, without the help of her son or husband, Leonardo was taken to the morgue. The story goes that once there, she dissected a corpse and cut it into nine pieces in under 12 minutes, which horrified and convinced the authorities who witnessed it. Without a shadow of a doubt, Leonardo Cinciulli was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years in prison and three years in an asylum, much like the Romani had predicted in her youth. Leonardo became known as the soap maker of Correggio, the pot that she had used to boil her victims was donated to the Criminological Museum in Rome, where it can still be seen today. In 1970, Leonardo died of cerebral apoplexy while in a women's criminal asylum. Leonardo had committed three atrocious murders, all in the hopes of keeping her son safe during World War II, and to stop a curse that seemed set on killing all of her children. So what became of Giuseppe? Little is known exactly what happened to Giuseppe Cinciulli, as there aren't many details. But it appears that he managed to survive a war that killed countless others. Was this unlikely survival because of his mother's human sacrifices? We'll let you decide. <laughs>